So, uh, thanks everybody for showing up. We have uh, really did have a pretty good prayer session. Uh, we still need to pray. There's a lot to pray about. And we're basically going to be starting at 1130, probably go to 1230, give or take, get our hour in. Uh, I have this up on Facebook and YouTube, this disclaimer that these my videos, my talking are for educational purposes, but I am discipling. I'm educating people in the Word of God, what it means to be in the Word of God, how to truly interpret the Word of God, so that we you can fight against these powers, principalities, wicked, evil spirits uh, that cause so much torment in your life. So much despair. And I want to tell you, good people, if you're having problems in your life and you're fighting against demons and it you feel like it's not working, join the club. You know, uh, I'm fighting. I see, because of my experience and knowledge, I see the areas where I've personally fall, fallen or are letting uh, demons into my life. And I feel like I'm playing a game of chess where I'm getting put in checkmate. It's not that I'm purposely doing something. It's that I'm being moved and manipulated into it. Because... The end times, I think, are here. I mean, they're putting on a full frontal attack. And so when you have disharmony in your home, when you have disharmony at work, when you're listening to bad music, when you're watching bad TV shows, when you're doing drugs and alcohol, these things that we used to get away with, um you may want to reconsider because we have the grace of God to do them all. God's not going to be mad at us if we, we are doing these. He's not going to not love us, but it's a doorway to Satan, and he's an opportunist. If you need, Do you guys need this fan kicked on now that we turned off earlier? If you do, go ahead and turn it on for them. We do have the overhead fan. I don't know how you guys are feeling. Yeah. Um, so that this is why I'm teaching. This is teaching and education and teaching you the Word of God. Now, I want to put it out there that I am so adamant about my teaching because there's so many churches that are being deceived lately. They used to teach good doctrine and had a little bit of a little foggy turning to maybe a little rough road. You know, like if you take a trail or a road from here to there, from point A to point B, they got to point A, point B, but they might have had some sidetracks. They might have had a flat tire along the way. But now it seems like they're totally going to a different direction. It's like they're from Sacramento heading up to Reno, and somehow they decided to take 49 down to Placerville, then from Placerville down to 88, then they're up there, and they're going through all these terrible sidetracks trying to keep them away from getting to Reno. And that's, I mean, some pastors that I... No, used to have the correct doctrinal beliefs. I just heard him preach last Wednesday, completely falsehood, completely preaching against what he used to teach, completely be, being deceived and falling into the trap of the devil. Okay, we got to be positive, absolutely follow scripture. And if it says what it says, it means what it means. I don't care how we feel. And we got to adjust our life to it. You guys hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. So uh, that being said, if you have any questions, uh, you can email me. 
put your questions down. Yes, she can. Mandy can sit right there along, alongside. Yeah. Do you want? Hey, do you want someone to bring a chair, extra chair, right over here? Do you want to bring an extra chair for Amanda? I could have Dave. She'll want to sit here. Okay. Or she could sit right next to you where your purse is. Whatever. Anyway, let's get on. You guys are adults. You can sit anywhere you want. Bless. Bless the word, Lord. Bless us that sermon. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm the one opening in prayer. We, The man that usually does it is taking a little break for a while. And so um, I'm going to try to ask this blessing that Holy Spirit, um, as David always as always says and is blessed, uh, give me ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to teach what you are teaching us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Okay, so we're in... What? <coughs> Yes, please go on to live. Change it. Yeah, have it face towards me. It is going live. Just move it towards me. And it might be tight enough to let go. Is that good enough? Are you there? It went from uh, it went from another uh, try Gemini. <sighs> let me pause this. That's all right. And none of this was being recorded. Okay, so those on YouTube. Uh, we just read Revelation chapter 18, verse 9 through 24. I had you on pause. Uh, you could go back and read that on your own. Uh, at least I noticed the pause <laughs> now. <laughs> pause button was on. Now, we got to understand while reading this that Jesus told us not to store up treasures here on earth where rust and moth can destroy or a thief could steal them. Rather, you should store them in heaven where nothing can diminish your wealth. So, yes, sir. I have a question. So, you shouldn't have a savings account? You shouldn't have, well, yes and no. You might need a savings account to buy and make monthly payments, car payments, this because of the way we do commerce. But you should not purposely save for your retirement. If you happen to live in a job that offers retirement, which I believe yours does, that's part of your pay. Okay? Uh, but the point is that in, there, in this point in time and in today, many people will not help you because they don't say they don't have the money. But they might be putting a thousand dollars a month into their 401k, and they say, "Well, I can't help you pay your rent." Well, what God says is that money that you are putting up will cry out against you, because I think it's James, or at least one of the epistles in the New Testament, says that if you have the means to help somebody. And just say, I'll be filled with God. God bless you. Let me pray for you that God will help you. And you got the money to give them and don't give it to them. You're at fault. See, it's not God's will that one man be a multi-billionaire and another person be on welfare. That's the will of the devil. Okay, so you're right. You don't have a, a savings account, but you're wrong. You can have a savings. I have a savings account. Okay, because I have to make huge, huge, huge payments once a month. And some every three months. So I got to save the for the three ones I pay every three months. Well, how about if you have one where you got to pay once a year, you know? which technically we do for our solar, right? Once a year. So we need to have savings accounts to put that in. But that's not for our retirement. That's for your 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 day-to-day -day life. You're just paying it. Does that answer your question? Okay, so the reason I mention this first off is, yes. But I, um, like you said, yes, your work. I have a retirement through your work. Through my work. Work. 
But that was part of your wages. That okay, yeah. You you had none, you, you didn't have an option to do that. No. You couldn't say like, don't take that money out. You know that was part of your union. One of the right. things to do. Um, but there are people that have that. And the union or your your things will say, well, we'll put in, we'll, we'll match you. It may be 50%, right? And then you go and do it. Yeah, no, I That's that. wrong. You know, you can't help somebody because you're putting money in and it would be like 50%. The world would say that that is a great investment that you should do that. We have financial advisors that tell you that's what they do. As a matter of fact, one of the most well-known financial advisors in the Christian realm says you're not to give to God, you're not to give to the church, you're not to give to everyone until you give to yourself and get yourself out of debt. Get yourself out of debt, have a three-month supply you're not to give money to god in any way shape or form then he says that way you'll have money to give to god but you're not to enter debt well how could you not enter debt in today's society there's not a person alive, even this person that is not in debt if you use money you're in debt because god did not create money god created an agrarian society hello Hello. He uses money for trade, but he did not create money or pay people in money. He paid people who didn't who walked out of their inheritance who were like farmers. They would work the the the, the people that picked the fields, he would give them a you would have to have money to pay for them a day's wage. But who were they? They were people that have forsaken their own inheritance, you know, their own farm. They were foreigners that would come in to get paid. Well, how do you pay a foreigner that comes in to pick your fields? You pay them a good wage, a denarii, a daily, a good, honest wage for their work. But you can't give them your land because you were supposed to hold your land as an inheritance to your kids. You were never to get rid of your land. Okay? Now, sometimes you would, uh, crops would fall, or you would fail, you'd get blight or mildew because you weren't worshiping God, and you allowed Satan in your life, and you would so sell yourself as a servant to someone who didn't. They then would keep you for that six years and then release you the seventh, giving you a double portion the seventh year, giving you twice as much as you made on the sixth year and release you back. Okay, so there's was use for money, but it's not how God blessed you with money. God did not bless you with money in the Old Testament. He blessed you with fruit. He blessed you with your cows having multiple cows, your sheep having multiple sheep, your barley fields growing multiple bushels of gar barley, your wheat field, your fish, all these things is work because God can do it. An evil man can't. See, an evil man can't sit there and say, I'm going to go catch all the tuna in the world and catch them. He could go try. He could buy the best equipment. He could use the most despicable means of doing it, but he cannot catch those fish. But the man of God could go out there and just cash his net on the right side and bring it, get such a heavy load that he can't even bring it into his ship because it's a from God. But money, you could lie, you could steal, you could call somebody up and get information from them and they could wipe out your account, all your money. See, God does not operate on money. So when we start moving into these end times, we're going to have to learn not to operate on money. Even though we have it now, even though we use it now, what are you going to do when all the money you have, like people say, our, our economy is going to a collapse? If it does, what are you going to do? I don't have a land of farm. 
There ain't a person in here that has land to fight. Is, are we all going to starve? Well, I guarantee, not hopefully, guarantee you, if you're following God, no, you will not. God may bring a raven to bring food. God may cause the wicked to bring truckloads of food for you, but you will not go hungry if you follow God. So it's kind of hard to do it. So we take this Matthew chapter 6, verse. Um, yeah, I'm trying to get my, there it goes. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. And this is what the Holy Word of God says. This is why I'm trying to tell you, you got to teach what the Bible says, not what your heart says, not what your mind says. You got to teach what the Bible says. And this is what Jesus Christ says. Now, if I had this in like a lot of your Bibles, Red letter. You got a new Bible? Look that up. See if this isn't red letter. This is what Jesus has said. It's the recording of what Jesus said. Lay not up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust do corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But, that word but negates the previous statement. He doesn't say, but don't lay up. He says, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust do corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart, there your heart be also. So if your treasure's on earth in a 401k, that's where your heart is. That's what you're going to support. But if you give that and sow that money into other people's life, the word of God says if you lend to the poor, God will repay you. And he's not skimpy. He doesn't say if you put money into a stock market, God will bless you. He says for you to store up in heaven. Well, how am I going to put a dollar bill in heaven? Anybody got an idea how I could take a dollar bill and store it in heaven? Put it in the offering. Very good. How about if you see that guy at Walmart or you're at the bank teller, he comes up, he's strung out, you know he's a user and he asks you for five bucks. Okay, ask God real quick and discern. But God says give to the poor. He didn't say give to the righteous. Remember, God says he is, I, I, through, I believe it was Solomon, says I've never seen the righteous beg, break, or beg for food. I've never seen the sons of the righteous beg for food. So these people that are begging for food, the poor, are they righteous? No. But God says to give to the poor, to give to the unrighteous. Now, who are you to say that if they take that $5 you did and just go down and buy a beer with it or buy some meth with it or buy whatever they're going to... Who says that you are to be their judge over that? See, the Word of God tells us we cannot judge the outsider. We only judge those of the household of God. Now, how many people do you know that hold an upstanding job, pay their taxes, and maybe on the weekend go clubbing, go out and get drunk, go buy some meth or drugs? Do you think that we have a right to say, no, employer, do not pay that man because all you're doing is enabling him? See, that's pride. But he's still not, but whether he... Whether you pay him or not, he's still got to have a place to live. He's still got to eat. That's right. The, the drug is the problem he has. That's dr you're uh, exactly right. I hope they see it. She said the drug is a problem he has. They still need to eat. They still need a place to live. They still need to help survive. So the point is, I'm trying to say is, God tells us to give money to the poor. And he says he will repay. God says he has never seen the righteous beg for food. Therefore, we could assume the righteous are never poor. Meaning desolate, no place to live. 
no place to eat. Now, if you make a hundred dollars and you give nine and you have fifty dollars uh, expenses and you give forty eight dollars away that month, the world would say you're poor. No, you're not poor. You paid all your debts and you put fifty percent or close to that into the kingdom of heaven. See, I totally believe in tithing. I totally believe in giving. But I don't say you do it to get rich. I say you do it to store money up in heaven. And then let God take care of you here as his ser servant, heir. His, your, your, uh, the military pays our, 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 the government pays our military people, right? So if you're in the army of God, let God pay for your housing. Let God pay for your shoes. Let God pay for your, your uh, clothes. Let God pay for your house. Because your money, your bank account is going to deplete. It's, you're going to run out. And trust me, in our battle, I'm probably not even going to get through this. I'm, um, in our battle that we've been having, I swear, in the last two weeks, it's been terrible, our fight, our battle. Personally, me, the man who gets up every morning and prays and prays and prays. I have my prayers written on a piece of paper so I don't forget any who reads and studies, who is specifically, with all humility, trying to follow God and do what's right. And I make one mistake. I turn left when I'm supposed to turn right. It is so hard for me in the last two weeks. Again, like I say, this guy called me yesterday begging me to come get him and help him. And I had to say, no, I can't do it. Because I felt by the power of the Holy, the leading of the Holy Spirit, that if I brought him into my house, because I have let all this stuff happen, it would cause more damage in my house. My wife would have more damage. My daughter would have more damage. My house would have more damage. But nevertheless, I said, if I get done with all the stuff I'm having to do, I'll call you and come see you. Well, guess what? Last night, our garage door broke. It took me and my uh, daughter's boyfriend a couple hours just to get it where we could get the car out of the garage so my wife could take it. Now I'm going to have to either buy a new garage door or somehow fix that and buy parts or something, but it's going to, I'm not going to have a garage for a lot of time or no more free time. It's because these attacks we're being have. I'm trying to tell you people, the word of God is true. Follow the word of God. If you can't, if you, if you find it hard to trust in your future, that God's going to protect you in your future, which I do. You're going to struggle. Because all the money we personally have had, have lost, at least three times, maybe, at least two times, maybe three, depending on, because the third time is coming back, where I've been forced to the 401, my employer's doing it, and lost everything. The last one before that, we lost everything. And not only did we lose it, it cost me $1,800 in extra taxes to have nothing. So all those thousands and um, tens and, well, we didn't have hundreds of thousands at that time. But we had a, a, we had a significant amount. We all lost and it, I had to pay the IRS more money. We started from a negative. Okay. Don't put your trust in money. I don't care who tells you how you how to invest. If you invest for your future through manna on earth, you're following the devil. Those are the words. God says right here, do not. Does anyone know what do not means? 
It means don't. It doesn't mean, ah, think about it, don't put your heart in it. It says do not. Say something. Say something. Oof. It is very hard sometimes to do like this. Like not, not to do it all to another individual in such a manner because the Bible says that you know like a very So then uh then see other people. Grandfather, and sometimes I say, Okay, God, uh, what is the thing you have to tell me? <laughs> yeah. No, no, but seriously, sometimes I say, Oh, God, I don't know. Well, okay. are you done? Okay, I said this is the last part. Uh, say so. So God addresses that in the, in the Bible, and we heard it on TV, or I showed it on TV the other uh, uh, to my wife the other day as one of these people we watch who is a false teacher. I'm not saying you can't watch false teachers. A matter of fact, I kind of sometimes recommend you do because they're 99% correct are 95% correct, and they walk into the areas where these really conservative teachers won't go, okay? But one of the things was is that God wants you to be uh, 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 wealthy, and don't be afraid when you're wealthy that, you know, people like me are saying you're putting your heart in the wrong place. But I put the Bible out, and I showed my, my uh, wife, it says, don't be afraid when you see the wicked get their wealth. In other words, don't lose your heart and your faith in God when you see the wicked prosper and you're scraping and bending by the ear. You're clawing for everything you get. Now, is that prosperity to claw for everything you get? Depends if you got it and you get to go to heaven. But I get the gloat on my sister. She's single. She has nothing but help, help, help people. And she's, can I say old? I did. And retired. And she's blessed. I mean, she has life easy. But she has an uncertain future, you know? But you can look at it and say she know that it's still, even though it's uncertain how it's going to fold out, he's always going to take care of her. That's hard for me. I keep saying, well, when I'm gone, who's going to take care of me? I mean, yes. But there are times that when things come against me, I have to go back and look at my life and what has gone done. And talk myself out of the fear. Why am I fearing of what might be? Has not God every step of the way taken care of me? And I can list the areas that God has taken care of me. Then I can relax and say, okay, I, you know, I'm not worried anymore. Right. But I do have to once in a while go back and evaluate. Right. Like Davidson, talk, talk myself down. Talk yourself out of it. Yeah. Right. Great, you uh, do. Thomas, would, uh, you know, my, my sister. Yes, you both right. Yeah. Good, uh, good explanation or observation. No way. Yeah, I know I see this, but I see it. It's a little obvious. So there are concessions. Like a lot of these little, as they say, she just said, they said that we're supposed to, uh, should say okay. Whenever we find ourselves in some type of trouble, yes, it's right, right it down and says, have, have I got this? You know, they don't say God is deserved, they say it's a sin. So that gives them a faith. 
So yeah. not to hang on to the fake way, yes. Yeah. Just for me to sit here and say that I know everything, I know what's going to happen. I'm I'm constantly reminded by David saying God has given me the strength to pull an iron bow. Now they didn't have iron bows. It's not like you made I he's saying they had iron, you know iron's not going to flex, okay? It's not like they had iron crossbows, okay? But he's saying it God's given me the the strength to pull an impossible bowl that no one could pull. Well, that means he has to be in a battle. Why is he pulling? It? How about King David? Like when his, his his king Saul is trying to kill him, and God, and time after time, King uh, David doesn't retaliate. King David blesses him. Right when he's trying to kill him. So the, these things are not easily required. As you said, your, your help groups try to tell you to do that. My sister says that she does that. It's still, if it, it's not easily done. And our tendency, let me let this thing go. Our tendency is not to do it. Our tendency is to quit. Oh, I just want to quit. I'm tired of fighting. For me, I'm tired of fighting. I want to quit. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of every day having a problem. Oh, woe is me. I'm tired of fighting. Well, who's trying to get me to quit fighting? The devil. So am I doing an effective job of fighting the devil? Apparently I am. I see my head shaking. If God, Satan wants you to quit fighting, it must be because you're making an impact. Right? So when we do these things, it's hard to see the truth. When we don't see... And we have to take count that, hey, God's always done this in the past. It's because we can't see the truth. So we have to, like, stop and meditate. And that's what I do. I stop and meditate. I'm tired of doing this. Well, meditate on God says meditate on his work. Well, why are you tired? Because Satan's trying to get you to stop. Why is he trying to get you to stop? Because you're making a dent in the spiritual kingdom of the devil. You're making a dent in spiritual warfare. You're making a dent in people's lives. I don't know if you know it. I mentioned before I have a list. I pray for you all. Do you, can, can you all meditate and think that your life is better once you've been with me than it was before? Okay, I will say this. Uh, every day I wake up. <laughs> I don't want to get up. I'm like, wow, there's this power that I can't destroy. I get up, I try to do what I Whereas before, oh, I was just later on. I was, uh, fortunately, practicing what is it now? I, uh, I asked myself, it's like, how come I can't fill that company? I started realizing it wasn't that I was necessarily it was like I didn't care. You didn't care? Right. Yeah, so I'm not saying that I didn't have a problem with these things that I didn't care. Now, uh, as I sit here, and uh, every now and then it might cross my mind. I'm supposed to take a shot. You, you realize you, you're, you're saying it quiet? And I can't hear you, but oh, that means nobody else can hear you. I'll so if I can't hear you, what good does it mean to talk? Okay. I'll say it louder. Uh, now and then I'll just uh, earnest and 
smoke pot or drink or I'll even have drinks. This is the crazy part. Where I'll, I'll be smoking a joint. And I'll wake up my stall and I gotta I gotta go apologize to you. And uh doesn't happen. That's the hardest part. I realize now if I went back to that stuff, my life would be different. I've uh I've experienced what it's like not to have to actually feel yes yeah, yeah I'm not saying it's a great life but uh I'm, I'm, I'm learning but I have to consider I have a I'm a person yes okay so obviously we're not going to do this study <laughs> I, I'm a, I'm going to do it next week but. That being said, I'm moving way far ahead. You could put it on your things. You talked about you're tempted to use dr drugs, sorcery. Uh, you're tempted to smoke pot, I think he said, right? Um, as we study this chapter, we're going to find out that these people become enslaved to do the will of the great whore, Babylon, and their merchants buy their buy their their goods through sorcery. Does anyone here want to take a, a a gander what sorcery is? What's wrong? I was looking for David. I tried to figure it out back there. She was wants something that I don't. Just wants to be petted. So David, I mentioned. Does do you know what sorcery means? Like, let's say I smoke it. Smoking weed get a certain effect. Like, it's, it's usually um the mind. Okay, so are you saying smoking weed is sorcery? Well, I say yes because it's changing. Uh, well, one is like demons in. Okay. So I want to I want to clarify this, and I'm not advocating and say you can smoke. I'm not saying it. Sorcery is making the pot available in a product for you to smoke. Sorcery is making heroin. It's not taking heroin. So you are a sorceress, whether you're casting a spell, it's not the spell, it's the witch or warlock behind it. If somebody's making mind-altering drugs, they're the sorcerers committing sorcery. You're the victim. You understand? That's why the, I have compassion for people, and I know a lot of us engage in that. I have compassion, and I don't judge, but I come against the sorcerers. I come against the people. I pray against the people that are making it and providing it. We call them drug lords, right? They got their power through sorcery. If you don't believe me, let's look at what this word means when it says sorcery in chapter 18. Okay? Hopefully you can hear this. Pharmacia. What's that sound like? Pharmacy. Pharmacy. Pharmaceutical, right? You go to a pharmacy and you could buy what kind of pain pills? Opiates, right? And what are opiates? Mind-altering drugs. They don't stop the pain. They don't cure the pain. They don't reduce inflammation to stop the pain. They make your brain not register that pain is there. So when you go under a knife and they're cutting you, your nerves are saying, whoa, that hurts but it doesn't get from there to your brain and interprets it as pain, right? So that's what pharmaceutical is making mind-altering drugs. So is a anti-inflammatory pharmaceutical? No. Be okay, because it's not mind-altering. 
Okay, so how it doesn't have to be just drugs. Sometimes uh, we talk like witches; they can they can catch you over through their beauty, right? Their beauty, your lust, and they say you're bewitched, right? You ever who's bewitched you? You know, you're caught in captive by their beauty, by their enticement. That's pharmaceutical. The use, the use are the administration of drugs, a pharmaceutical. He, he's, he's doing that. But he also could be giving you an aspirin, right? You could go and get Tylenol, extra strength, whatever, by a prescription from a pharmacy, right? Okay. How about poisoning? You ever watch uh, uh, Disney's, what was it, Snow White? And the witch poisoned an apple? That was sorcery, right? Right. Okay. How about the magic? Yes. You know, people get caught up in this so easy. And I see it on Facebook all the time. Godly things. They use godly things. And you, you go on there and they say, if you answer this within 90 days, you will get all your needs met. You know, that God will meet all your needs. And you click on it. That's that's sorcery because you know you're saying I'm using this, expecting God to do that. No, right. that that doesn't work. And so who's the one that gets has to pay the consequences from God? Not from you, like if you do that, but it's the sorcerer, right? They're the one that God's going to punish, not you that did it. You, because you could become engaged in that by being deceived, right? You can think, oh, that would be a great thing to do. And you might suffer some really bad consequences, but those consequences are not from God. But the wrath of God is poured out on the sorcerers. You got you to get that. So those that practice the magic arts, often found in connection with idolatry and the and fostered by it metaphorically speaking deception which you talked about seduction which i talked about uh with the woman bewitching you and idolatry worshiping a false god and real jesus the bible says do you know like we took brought before do not store up on earth right but some Christians will say you got to store up on earth to give an inheritance to your children's children. That's sorcery. They are committing sorcery and they're in the church because they're teaching what the Bible doesn't say. Okay, John, the Bible does say give an inheritance to your children's children. He's talking to the nation Israel that had land and they received the land. So if you get a plot of land, let's say you live in Woodland and you were given 250 acres, okay? And as a uh, hundred years ago, your ancestors owed a thousand acres, right? Because each time as time goes by, you're getting less and less and less because if you're given to this kid and you're given to that kid, you know, you have to, the plot of land gets smaller and smaller until eventually there's nothing left. Well, if you take the land of Israel, it would go out to 7,000 years, years if you kept dividing it down and down where there was nothing to give anymore. Okay? So the point is, it was for the Israel to make sure they didn't sell their land away, to make sure they didn't engage in deception someone con you out of the money and god says well i know men could get deceived and i know they're deceivers so how am i going to make that possible he makes the sabbath year that every 50 years no matter how screwed up you were that land your partial land goes back to the original owner so that you can always give an inheritance. But what if you do what if you get rid of all your land at the 25th year? You got 25 more years to go, right? Now you're gonna have to go work on the fields for a daily wage. 
And now you're going to have to take that daily wage and pay your rent and buy your food, right? You're now going to be indebted to the person that pays you that, right? And God says, don't do that. But he knows people will. And he makes a way of escape so it eventually gets turned back. But that's not for Christians today because we don't have any land to give. You know, it wasn't for when Jesus Christ walked the earth. You know, Jesus had no inheritance in Israel. He had no plot of land to leave his children. His parents didn't have any plot of land. His uh, father, not heavenly father, uh, Joseph didn't have a plot of land to give. Jesus could not fulfill the law. Jesus did not leave any land to his children's children. He didn't have children. Do you know that the law wanted you to have kids? If you didn't have kids, you were, you were robbing God, which is why it was expected of every male, even if his first wife could not bear children, that he would get one that would. We call them concubines. Now, not all people did, but that's what the law expected. So when the word of God says, give and inherit to your children's children, he's talking about the promised land of Israel. Jesus now is saying, that's done away with. That's gone. You ain't getting that back. Come in me. Get fulfilled with me. And when we bring down my temple and it comes down on earth and you're going to rule and reign with me a thousand years, you're going to have all this land. And he's going to make you a ruler over not only 10 cities, but 100 cities, et cetera, et cetera, depending on um, how well you followed him. You see, this is the word of God. We got to teach the word of God. But there's really loving people that I am totally convinced they're loved. They love God, but they're bewitched. They are been bewitched by sorcerers, and now they are doing, they're like apprentice sorcerers. Now they're teaching that same sorcery. Now they will be judged. How does God judge a Christian's supposed to judge Christians, right? How do we judge? We pray for them that God perhaps will give them repentance that they come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive at, by him at his will. Our job is to pray for these people, not to excommunicate them, because they could have 80% really good like I, the people I'm referring to, I'm not mentioning their name. They say this, they're wrong. They are 100% wrong. But they are so right when it comes to healing. They are so right when it comes to receiving your, your gifts, your, your authority in Christ. They are so right in that area that it would be a great error for you not to participate with them in that area. God wants you well. God does not want you sick. There's a lot of Christians that are sick. My wife, my sister have medical issues that they have to take drugs for. God does not want that. Well, is God mad at them? Is God mad at me? No, but he doesn't want that. But there's things that have been set in place in this world. There's things that we've eaten for decades that might have caused diabetes. There's, there's pollutions that uh, we've been done. We might have smoked for all kind and caused lung cancer, right? Or caused some other issues in our body that God didn't want us to do. And God's fighting and fighting but we got to come to our senses and then we got to start believing in these groups of people to overcome our ignorance, the things we did in ignorance. See, David, King uh, um, Paul says that God forgave him of his sin because he did it in ignorance. How many of us have lived a life in ignorance that is causing diabetes? 
causing high blood pressure, causing uh, bad eyesight. How many of us have done that? God doesn't throw us away. He says, okay, you're screwed up. Let me work in you. Oh, no, I can't. It's too late now. I need to do this. And God's saying, no, what I've done for one, I'll do for you. Look at that person over there, completely healed of, uh, uh, of leprosy. Look at that person over there, completely blind. I healed them. What I've done for one, I'll do for you. Will you believe it? That's hard. We got to believe the truth of God, even though they've been bewitched in their other er, other areas to bring you capt into captivity of the devil. We got to watch and pray in the Holy Spirit that we can discern the word of God. And when somebody says something and the Holy Spirit says that's not right, go to the word of God and read it. One example I was talking about was this pastor that I used we used to know uh, used to correctly believe that angels did not have come down on earth and have sex with women and produce giants. The word of God says in Genesis 6 that the sons of God seen the daughters of men and took them as wives. But Jesus says in the kingdom of heaven, there is neither marriage or given in marriage. Angels don't have wives. If you take that as the word of God, that angels don't have wives, you know that demons cannot have sex with human beings and take them as wives. Why? Because God, Jesus, specifically said, angels cannot have wives. They don't reproduce. They don't have offspring. The kingdom of hell is not increasing because demons are getting other people pregnant. They can't do this. So why is this pastor thinking that? Because he is not rightly dividing the word of God. The word of God says, don't do drugs. Be sober. Oh, well, I need them. Okay. Word of God says, don't do drugs. Well, I need them. If I start taking them, I'm going to die. Okay. Start praying where you delete that, where you don't take them. I mean, where you, you're not going to die, and then you won't need them. You're taking diabetes medicine. Well, pray that you, you don't need the diabetes medicine. So when you quit taking it, you don't die. Metaphorically speaking, right? If you're taking an antidepressant, a lot of people take antidepressants and you can't stop. If you do, the kid, you could die. Okay? I know when you go to jail, a lot of times they give you antidepressants that are so bad, it's hard to get off. If you go under for a psychological reason, okay? Pray that you get healed so when you quit taking them, you don't die. If you have high blood pressure, pray that your high blood pressure is cured so you don't have to take it. You can sit there, hey, look, my blood pressure is under control. Let's start reducing this medication. The doctor reduces it. Hey, my blood pressure is still under control. Let's start reducing it. Don't be stupid because once, once the effect has happened, once we've done that, God has to work through us, and he has to work through us that are under the laws of physics. I'm going to close with this. Can you jump out of an airplane and God hold you up and you fly in the air? Is that possible? Yeah. Is it possible God could do that? Well, I don't know, but it's not possible with the laws of physics. It's not possible with the laws of physics. Is God going to break the laws of physics? I don't think so. But can God bring an angel to lift you up? Sure. Absolutely. But you can't fly because that would break the laws of physics. You can't jump out of an airplane tempting God. That would be tempting God for an angel to pick to, yeah. to lift you up. Just like Jesus. Jesus couldn't fly. 
the word of God said an angel would pick him up. And Jesus, as she said, said, don't do that. So God's got to work through the laws of physics. So if you're on 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 uh, uh, psych meds, don't just stop taking them. Get healed where you don't need them. If you're on high blood pressure medicine, just don't stop taking it. I don't think you need it. Get healed so you know you don't need it with everything else. My brother right here, Juan, he's diabetic. We kept his insulin, spare insulin in our refrigerator from him just so when he would come, he would have it. So does God want him to have diabetes? No. Does Satan? Yeah. And we're able to use pharmaceutical, right? Pharmacy insulin to keep you from dying. So that's why I classify this. It's mind-altering drugs. Taking high blood pressure medicine this is not my natural drug, but taking heroin is. You get it? Lord, bless these people as we go, and thank you for letting me get this uh, rant and rave off. Hopefully next week we can get right into the Word of God, start preaching this, because the end times are coming, and if they're going to be thousands of years later, uh, so be it. I'm getting old enough where it's really not going to matter. I'm leaving one way or the other. Uh, I want to be uh, I want to be ready and I want to make sure everybody here, everybody that I speak to is ready. Not that you can be make yourself ready, but ready is being in Christ. Being in Christ. Always following Christ. And I pray for supernatural anointing and protection that when we pray for these things that I've been preaching, that we see the outcome, that we see our rent paid, that we see extra food on our table, that we have extra money to give away to bless, that we start uh, tithing or giving your offering, that we put our faith and trust completely in you, that you will always, uh, I don't want to say make up the difference, but give us more than we need. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let's eat. Well, it's going to take probably about a half hour. Okay. Oh, I thought that was Rigby.